which is Psalm 23. So I want to have you turn there with me. And this morning, I'd like to talk to you specifically about how to suffer in spiritual victory. How to suffer with spiritual victory. And while you're finding Psalm 23, let me tell you about it. It is a terrifying experience. It has happened to American troops overseas multiple times. It happened 17 years ago to a brave company of British paratroopers. It happens to civilians who take a wrong turn while just going on a walk. It has happened since the early 1860s. It is the experience of accidentally walking into a minefield. Even the earliest landmines never stopped posing danger in 1960. Five unexploded landmines were discovered on a Civil War battlefield, 97 years old and still primed to explode, and had to have explosive experts come and dismantle them. Maybe you haven't ever walked into a minefield, but if you think about it for a moment, you can imagine the emotion, you can imagine the, the, the sudden surge of adrenaline, the sudden, sudden panic. You didn't mean to end up in the minefield. There's shock, there's distress, and the first thing and the only thing you can think about is how am I going to get out of here? I don't want to be in the minefield. I didn't, I didn't ask for this. I need to get out. And literally, in a matter of seconds, your entire mind frame is shifted. Now, I, I don't know if any of you have actually been in the minefield. That'd be kind of cool if you had been. I'd like to ask you about it. But there is a minefield that you have been in. You're in it now, or you will be in it. Those are your three options. And that's the minefield of suffering, of tragedy, of sudden overwhelming grief due to some unexpected agony that has abruptly become instantly your all-consuming reality. This is everything you're thinking about. And it's not so much the circumstances themselves that bring trauma and agony. It's what our minds do in response. All suffering only happens in one place. It happens in the mind. That's where the, the trial is. And to be fair, suffering is rarely, if ever, planned. This sudden unexpected agony that has suddenly become your all-consuming reality, you might be going through a marriage that's falling apart despite your best efforts. You might wake up one day to realize that the pain medication that was so helpful after surgery has now become an addiction. You might be feeling perfectly fine one day and then wake up a month later in the hospital not even knowing what happened after a major debilitating health episode. You might receive a diagnosis that means massive and expensive and risky treatment. You might have a child who has grown up to be exactly the opposite of who you trained him to be, what you hoped he would be, what you dreamed he would be. And that's just in your personal life. That doesn't even count the spiritual pressure that we feel living in a world that hates Christ, that belittles Christians, and seems to be headed off a cliff as fast as it possibly can go. We're living in Romans 1. We're living in a day where people have gone crazy with sin. And so for us as Christians, the, the question is, how does my faith impact suffering and trials in my life? And I would say this. I would say this is the momentous task of the Christian in walking with Christ. This is the measure of your maturity with Christ. This is the measure of your faith. How do you deal with suffering? That tells you everything you need to know about yourself in the Lord. And maybe a, a, another question to ask is, how can my salvation in Christ, how does that intersect with cancer? How does that intersect with an unfaithful spouse? How does that intersect with a wayward child? How does that intersect with my shattered dreams? Well, I'll give you the short answer. First of all, the short answer is that since you're one who has received the free gift of salvation in Christ, you have resources. You have resources from God who calls himself your shepherd and Promises to provide you all the comfort, all the assurance, all the consolation that your soul could ever need. Because remember, all suffering is in the mind. And so if the Lord is ministering to your mind and heart, then everything else is okay. And the longer answer about these resources is that Psalm 23 is really the, the treasure house where these resources reside. 
Now, I'd like to just read Psalm 23 to you, and, and I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, which is an update of the New American Standard, so it might be a little unfamiliar to some of you. The Psalm 23, the most famous of all the Psalms, is a Psalm of David, and it begins, Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely goodness and loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Now, as the superscription here says, this is most famous of all the Psalms was penned by King David himself. And the most famous line, arguably in all of the New Testament, begins traditionally, the Lord is my shepherd. In the Legacy Standard Bible, it's translated more precisely, Yahweh is my shepherd. We know this. I'm not giving you new truths right now that since we're blessed with the fullness of the revelation of the New Testament, we naturally read the Lord Jesus Christ is my shepherd. We understand that. We, we get that. For King David, though, he was writing, generally speaking, of God. And, and we understand the greater inspiration of his text. We understand how it intersects with the rest of the Bible. Jesus says of himself in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The writer of Hebrews calls Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep. 1 Peter 5, 4 calls Jesus the chief shepherd Prophetically, the Old Testament prophet Micah says of the one that would be born in Bethlehem, he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. And I could take time to preach a wonderful message on Christ as the shepherd, the shepherd king from Psalm 23. In fact, we could take it a step further. Psalm 23 is part of a three-part series. It's the middle of Psalm 22, 23, and 24, which is a, 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 a trilogy of sorts. In Psalm 22, Christ is the suffering servant who's crucified. You're familiar with Psalm 22, 16. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And then in Psalm 23, Christ is the shepherd who protects his people. Yahweh is my shepherd. And in Psalm 24, Christ is the king of all the kings. Psalm 24, 7, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. So you have the, the savior, the shepherd, and the sovereign in Psalms 22, 23, and 24. And each of them has a symbol embedded. Psalm 22, the savior's cross. Psalm 23, the shepherd's crook. Psalm 24, the sovereign's crown. And so it really forms this beautiful picture of the totality of the ministry of the second person of the Trinity. But I want to narrow our focus down just to Psalm 23, so filled with the riches of God for comfort, and also, by the way, serves as a mirror of your own heart. It serves as a reflection of how God deals with his children who are in dire need of reassurance and relief. So one of the big questions about Psalm 23 was, what was happening in King David's life when he penned Psalm 23, or at least what was the occasion that inspired it at a later time? I'll say more about this later, but 2 Samuel 17, beginning of verse 27, records a particular part of the occasion when King David was fleeing from his third son, his wicked son, Absalom. Absalom was attempting to take over the kingdom of Israel. This psalm mentions the valley of the shadow of death. This may refer to David's wanderings through some of the many valleys that he traveled in while he was fleeing from Absalom. David and his people, those who were loyal to him, they, they fled from Jerusalem. They fled from Absalom across the Jordan River to an area called Mahanaim. And while they were there, foreigners came with food and supplies to help them. And I'll get more into that in just a little bit. But I want you to notice something. If you're familiar with the episode of Absalom and, and David fleeing for his life and, and having to run from his own palace, David did not say one day, you know, I, I think today would be a good day for my son Absalom to try to kill me and 
take over my kingdom. It's a Tuesday. There's nothing else going on. I'm in the mood to run for my life. I haven't been outdoors in a while. Let's go for it today. Well, in the same way, you don't schedule trials. You don't schedule tragedy. None of you married couples have ever said, honey, could you check your calendar? I think November would be a good time for a stroke. Uh, Should we do it before Thanksgiving, just get it over with, or should we wait till after the last turkey sandwich is done? The most agonizing trials, they're agonizing because they're sudden. And you can be paralyzed with fear or dread or distress or grief. You don't know which way is up, but you can't stay where you are. You don't have a choice. It's an affliction, like it or not, that's part of your life. Like the woman who sat in my office crying and just said, I don't want to have cancer. I don't want to die. I don't want to leave my children behind. I don't want to leave my husband behind. I don't want to be in this pain. I don't want to have to be on medication so strong that they dull my brain. I don't want this. And she had one task left in this life, and that was to walk faithfully through her final trial. It's not something we plan. It's not something we put on the calendar. But in that moment... You have some needs. You have three of them. I'd like to show you from Psalm 23. You need a restful peace right now. You need an appointed path forward. And you need a future promise that you can cling to. So you need a restful peace. You need an appointed path. And you need a future promise. And Psalm 23 gives us all three of those. Let's start with the restful peace. We might think about Psalm 23 even as two different songs. It's the song of a sheep under the loving protection of a shepherd, and then it's also the song of a guest under the loving protection of a host. Two beautiful and and comforting pictures, and these represent really two different locations, the wilderness and the valley of the shadow of death. The shepherd protects in the wilderness, and the host prepares a meal, even the presence of spiritual danger in the valley. Now, the beloved King David of Israel, a man after God's own heart, but he was a man with enemies, a man who at times literally was hunted by those who hated him. And he begins, Yahweh is my shepherd. And I love this beginning because God's covenant name, Yahweh, it evokes to the Old Testament reader a rich image of the protection of a covenant-keeping God. It is his covenant-keeping name. That he's a God who says of himself in Exodus 34, 6, as he passed by Moses, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. And, And he immediately says, and in Hebrew, the words are right next to each other, Yahweh is my shepherd. The people of God were well acquainted with shepherds. They they understood this. And of course, David himself, long before he shepherded God's people as the king of Israel, he shepherded regular old sheep in the hills around Bethlehem. Now, I want you to think about this. It's really almost shocking to find the words Yahweh and shepherd right next to each other, the highest of the high and the lowest of the low. Even the Egyptians thought shepherds were so lowly that they wouldn't even associate with them. David is shockingly saying that the sovereign ruler of the universe has taken up the lowly task of shepherding him. That the creator of the ends of the earth is looking to his every need and necessity. And and David says, I shall not want. This isn't a statement that's hard to understand. It just simply means everything I need, I'll have. It's a simple statement of assurance that the shepherd never withholds anything that the sheep needs. How do you know that you have everything that you have? Because you have everything that you have. There's nothing complex. There's no deeper meaning to this. You have everything you need because Yahweh is your shepherd. And so God, the shepherd, provides for the sheep restful peace. And and he continues on with these picturesque images of peacefulness and tranquility. And they're, they're so easy to picture He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, as David well knew, sheep are naturally fearful. They won't lie down unless they're convinced that it's safe to do so. This isn't a picture of a shepherd sitting on the sheep, forcing the sheep to lie down. It's a picture of the shepherd soothing and comforting the sheep so that it's able to lie down. 
There's a, a sense of peacefulness, and, and not just lie down anywhere, but in green pastures, rich meadows where there's plenty of provision, no need to keep searching for sustenance of any kind. And, and as the sheep of God's pasture lies down in the soft green grass, fully provided for, fully sustained, the sheep notice the barely noticeable, the quiet waters. Not a scary, rushing river, just quiet waters. Literally in Hebrew, waters that are resting, waters that are at rest, serene waters that are safe and cool and refreshing. And now that you're lying down the green pastures besides, beside waters at rest, the shepherd restores your soul. That's an interesting phrase. That's actually a phrase that can be used to speak of spiritual salvation. In Hebrews 14 and Joel chapter 2, this exact Hebrew phrase means to bring to repentance or bring to conversion. That's a legitimate idea. But it's also used to speak of the spiritual refreshment, the spiritual re re nourishment of the believer. Psalm 19.7, the law of Yahweh is perfect, restoring the soul. Same phrase. It's the idea of returning to the place of peace where you once were, of regaining your spiritual equilibrium and of recapturing your trust in the Lord. And so the message of the opening verses is very clear. That God gives this perfect respite, this perfect provision. Doesn't matter what's happening outside this beautiful green valley of peace where the quiet waters are. In this place, it's just you and the shepherd. Just you and the shepherd. There's no one else. This place of restful peace is available anytime. It's available all the time. The doors to this valley are never closed. The grass in the valley is always green. The waters are always quiet. And the shepherd is always there. Right in the middle of your crisis or whatever is most troubling to you, the riches of the quiet comfort are your, of your shepherd are always accessible. They're always offered. There's never a time when those doors are closed. And that's where you have to start. You have to start with a deep spiritual breath to be reminded that your shepherd will give you a restful peace. And you have a, you have a second need, though, an appointed path. You need to know that there's a way out. You need to know that that which is scary, painful, and daunting has some sort of path to it. You don't want to walk this, through the situation, but you don't have a choice. Second half of verse 3, he guides me in the paths of righteousness. What righteousness are we speaking here? Uh, it, it can mean righteousness in the sense of uprightness and worthiness, but the context is not the righteous behavior of the psalmist. This is the psalmist. This is not about his behavior. This is not about his own personal sanctification, we could put it. It simply and elegantly means the right path, the accurate path, the correct path, the straight path. In fact, it literally says, he guides me in the wagon tracks of righteousness, meaning the place that has a, a deep rut in it, the place that is familiar. An alert shepherd would keep to those wagon tracks because they led back home. The wagon tracks were the way to safety. You're very familiar with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and I think this is actually often misunderstood. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Straight is the part that's often misunderstood. It doesn't mean that he'll make it easy. It doesn't mean that he'll make it exactly the way you want it. It means he'll make it acceptable. That he'll make it something that you can receive. It's manageable. God will make your path the one that you submissively receive from your hand. This same woman I spoke to you about earlier was able to come to a point that this is God's appointed path. And it's literally the only path upon which I can be content because this is the one God appointed. There is no other path of contentment. Sudden healing, sudden difference, su some sudden new treatment. Yeah, that would be nice, but that's not God's appointed path. God's appointed path is for me to walk through this. And he does this David says, for his name's sake. Here's a question for you. When you're tempted to panic, what kind of God would God be if he can't get you through some little trivial trial like dying when he's the one who created the heavens and the earth? 
when he's the one who made all things, when he's the one who sent his beloved son to die on the cross, the path that God is leading you on is for his glory, for his fame, for his honor. And can I tell you this? If you will embrace that appointed path as being all about the honor and the fame and the glory of God, and how is my life, how is my response going to bring honor to God, it becomes literally something that you can embrace as a challenge to the glory and honor of our God. And it actually can become pleasant and righteous. How glorious it is when the believer crosses into that area of saying, I know this is the worst trial I've ever endured in my whole life, but I'm enjoying the pleasantness of how this is honoring to the Lord. Now you're winning. Now you're winning the game, so to speak. But there is a reasonable question. What if my path is dark? What if it's treacherous? What if it's dangerous? What if it hurts? Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, I want you to notice something here. We're beginning to take a shift. There's a change that's happening. There's a, there's a direction alteration in Psalm 23. In verses 1 through 3, David is speaking about God, his shepherd. He makes me lie down. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness, in right paths. He's speaking to us. David is telling us about the riches of his shepherd. But now it gets intensely personal. Because as David turns to face the valley of the shadow of death, now David isn't speaking about the shepherd. Now David speaks directly to the shepherd. He says, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Who is leading me in the valley of the shadow of death? God is. But it's the right path. It's the right one. Now, the shadow of death isn't necessarily speaking of death itself, although there's definite application to this. It's just a phrase that means basically a scary place, any, any place that is scary and fearful. And this fits the shepherd metaphor. Shepherds at times would have to lead his sheep through shadowed ravines and, and riverbeds, and Israel's filled with stony mountainsides with hidden caves and canyons, often with wild beasts hiding in the shadows. And the area around Bethlehem where David had formerly kept his sheep is no exception to this. And God leads us through this appointed path of danger and difficulty. It's not the path you would have chosen, but you're growing, and it ought to be growing. You're growing profound trust in the Lord, says, the valley of the shadow of death is OK with me because I have next to me the light of the world. And he's right there with me. And so I will fear no evil. Nothing can harm me outside God's control, for you are with me. And I love this picture. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What are these? Well, there's two different things. A rod is a club that you would strike a wild animal that might harm the sheep. The staff is speaking of the shepherd's crook to keep the sheep on the right path. And what does this tell us? That God has a rod and God has a staff. It tells us that God is not distant. He's not aloof. He's intimately involved in the moment-to-moment -moment details of whatever it is you're walking through. He's right there. He's clubbing back that which he will not allow to harm you, and he's using his staff to point you precisely on the path that he would have you. How do you know that you're doing the Lord's will? Most of the time, it's going to be in retrospect. Oh, this was the path. I look backwards, and I see, what a path. I don't ever want to be on it again, but it was the right one. You might say it this way. If we were praying this prayer today, God, your big stick and your little stick, they comfort me. The great 19th century Scottish preacher, Alexander McLaren, he wrote this. He said, no wise forward look can ignore the possibility of many sorrows and the certainty of some. The road will not always be bright and smooth, but will sometimes plunge down into grim canyons where no sunbeams reach but even that anticipation may be calm. Thou art with me is enough. He who guides into the canyon will guide through it. It is not a dead end, but it opens out onto shining meadows where there is greener pasture. You need a restful peace. You need an appointed path. 
legitimate question. What if my appointed path not only looks scary, looks like a dark, dead-end canyon, what if it looks like it's going to end really, really badly? Yes, Alexander McLaren said that it opens into a shining meadow. What if mine opens into an even darker place? What if mine opens into tragedy that's so painful I can't even wrap my mind around it? Well, that's where the victory of being in Christ sparkles like a knight in shining armor. That's where the believer runs like the wind and, and sings like the angel. That's when Isaiah's great promise to the captive nation of Israel comes bursting out in triumph. You're familiar with Isaiah 40, 31. Yet those who hope in Yahweh will gain new power. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Because not only does God give you a restful peace and an appointed path, but he gives you a future promise. Gives you a future promise. And this is where true Christian victory comes into play. It's not just that God gives you calm now, although he does. It's not just that God gives you an appointed path, scary and dark though it may be. It's that if, even if, in the sovereign, bigger than I can comprehend plan of God, the worst case scenario comes to pass. That there is no happy ending in this life. You still have victory because the story isn't over. The story is never over for the Christian. And the, the metaphor now switches from God as your shepherd to God as your gracious host. It's one of the most amazing pictures in all of Scripture. In verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. For King David, this actually happened in reality as a, as a picture of a greater spiritual truth. When David came to Mahanaim, as recorded in 2 Samuel 17, listen to what happened, beginning in verse 27. Now, it happened that when David had come to Mahanaim, Shobi, the son of Nahash, from Rabbah, the sons of Ammon, Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite, from Regalim, brought beds, basins, pottery, wheat, flour, barley, roasted grain, beans, lentils, roasted seeds, honey, curds, sheep, and cheese of the herd, for David and the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. And you say, oh, isn't that nice? God brought some of David's friends to help him out in the wilderness. No, he didn't. God brought some of David's enemies to help him out in the wilderness. There's a little phrase in there, the sons of Ammon. Just a few chapters earlier, what was David doing to the sons of Ammon? He was destroying all of their cities and killing all of their people. And yet here they are being fed by the historic enemies of Israel. Just a few chapters earlier, this probably wouldn't have happened. And there's been a lot of speculation as to why the enemies of David would feed him and help him. And the, the best historical guess is that they'd rather an enemy that they know than some crazy kid named Absalom that they have no idea about. But that's just speculation. In the ancient Near East, if you were the honored guest in the house or the tent or the land of an important and wealthy host, that host was culturally obligated to protect you from everyone else. As long as you were his guest, this isn't a hasty meal on a battlefield. This is a calm and securely leisurely meal under the protective banner of a strong host. Whatever the enemies are that David is speaking of when he writes Psalm 23, the truth is clear, the larger spiritual truth, that when enemies are snarling and growling all around, David feasts in the presence of the Lord. And, and this is so paradoxical. This is such a, a twist in our mind. It's so difficult to comprehend that outside rages the storms of the enemy. Outside rages all the horrible things that, that threaten us, that make us feel like we're in trouble. The, the roars and the rumbles of everything that seems dangerous. And at the same time, your host says, may I fill your glass again? Would you like another steak? Could I show you the dessert tray, perhaps? and the soft string quartet playing in the background, and you're going, this is crazy. How can I have this sort of peace, this sort of fellowship? This is a picture of being treated lavishly by God. You have anointed my head with oil. 
Beginning as early as the ancient Egyptians, a host in the ancient Near East would anoint the heads and the beards and the feet of his guests with pleasantly scented oil. It took the layer of dust from travel off the head. It freshened the one who had journeyed. A complete contrast to the dust and the dread and the danger and the distress that were outside. And, and my cup overflows. There's no great hidden meaning here. This is extravagant treatment with more than you need. David is describing an ancient Near Eastern way of treating your host, and, and it's still practiced in parts of the world. Interestingly, in the early 1800s, there was a, an explorer named Captain James Wilson, and he wrote a book called Oriental Customs. And he wrote about visiting India into an area that, that to his knowledge, almost nobody had ever been to from outside the, the world. And, and he wrote this. I once had this ceremony performed on me in the house of a great and rich Indian in the presence of a large company. The gentleman of the house poured upon my hands and arms a delightful perfume, put a golden cup into my hands, and poured wine into it until it ran over. At the same time, he was assuring me that it was a great pleasure to him to receive me and that I should find a rich supply of my needs in his house to demonstrate the lavishness of his care the, the host literally was just pouring the wine till it was just spilling everywhere, saying, I have more than you possibly could ever need. To eat and drink at the table prepared by the Lord is a covenant bond. It's a, it's a promise. This is the same bond that Jesus spoke of when he promised all who belong to him that I will never leave you nor forsake you, that right in the trouble you, you can feast. You feast in the presence of the Lord. You feast on his word. You feast in prayer. You feast praising him in song. You feast on the fellowship of the church. You feast on the certain hope for the future. And you say, well, what, how, how do I feast? When you're in trouble, how about this? Sit down and read all the Psalms at one time. Sit down and pray for three hours. Gather with God's people. Send emails and texts to all your brothers and sisters in Christ and say, I need to hear from 20 of you a day for the next six months. Feast on all these treasures that God has given. Instead of receiving the Lord's table on occasion, receive the Lord's table every day if you need to. Whatever you must do, the feast is there. The buffet is there. Don't get to the buffet full, put it that way. And look what you're, we're, we're coming to. David leads us climactically here to verse 6. Surely goodness and loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. The goodness is a sign of God's favor, a sign of his love. Loving kindness is sometimes translated steadfast love. This is his covenant love. God never breaks covenant. He will always love you. And I love this. Goodness and loving kindness will pursue. David is being pursued by enemies, and God says, but your goodness and your loving kindness will pursue me. It will chase me down, and God always catches what he chases. And I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. This is an interesting verb in Hebrew, to dwell. This is, it means to return to dwell, to come back to something you used to have. David was anticipating returning to normalcy, returning to dwell in a long life spent in communion with the Lord. He was separated from the formal house of worship. The temple wasn't built yet, but the tabernacle was. The house of Yahweh is a technical term that can refer to any place that God has chosen to reveal himself, a place where he's worshiped. But it also speaks to the hope of dwelling in heaven with the Lord, this implicit promise of eternal life. You recall this, one of our favorite passages in John 14, where Jesus said, in my Father's house are many rooms. You remember he promised to bring you there, right? Your future promise is not that you'll dwell just in the house of the Lord forever. Here's the big deal. But the house of the Lord becomes your house. It's yours. I love to travel. I love traveling with my family and, and enjoying that. But you know, the only thing that's better than traveling is going home, right? Get into your own bed, opening a refrigerator that actually has food in it, and you know where it is. Walking through the kitchen in the ratty old pajamas that, that your family says, please don't ever wear those in public, but, but I can wear those at home. 2 Corinthians 5.8, the Apostle Paul describes heaven, you ready for this? as being at home with the Lord. 
Now, let's extrapolate the truth of that. Your future home will be more restful, more warm, you ready for this, more familiar than any place you've ever been. I often wonder what the first orientation in heaven will be like. Not sure we'll really need it. I can extrapolate from 2 Corinthians 5, 8, that when I arrive home in the house of the Lord, that the first experience will be, oh, this is home. This is home. Better than any temporary solace you've ever had. So what does this mean for you? What does it mean that God gives a restful peace and the pointed path a future promise? You ready for this? It means bring it on. I'm ready. I have the preparation. There is nothing that can happen in this world that can hurt me, not in any sort of lasting sense at all. Now, I have to say this. Psalm 23 is by far the most well-known portion of Scripture to the church. But statistically, did you know it's also the well, most well-known portion of Scripture to the non-believer? Did you know that no fewer than 18 rap artists have used Psalm 23 in their songs, and these are not Christian rap artists? It's in hip-hop songs. It's in even old country songs. Psalm 23 appears everywhere. And so it's important to be reminded that Psalm 23, knowing Psalm 23 is not the same as knowing the shepherd. It's not the same. The wrath of God was hurtling towards you. Jesus stepped between you and God, stepped between you and his holy, just indignation against your sin. Jesus absorbed the full force of the wrath of God on the cross and Jesus said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. And we say, oh, that sounds like Psalm 23. What does he say next? And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Having purchased the sheep on the cross, the, the sh Savior now tenderly shepherds them. And this is so important because all the comforts, all the spiritual benefits in the time of trouble given to us by Psalm 23 are not available to the one who says intellectually, the Lord is a shepherd. They're only available to the one who is in Christ and can say the Lord is what? My shepherd. Yahweh is my shepherd. I have one last thing. I want to point out in a little bit more detail how the Lord Jesus Christ illustrated that he is the shepherd of Psalm 23. And, and I said we wouldn't spend a lot of time on this, but we kind of have to just for a minute. When Jesus was on earth, everything he did, everything he said was completely intentional. And one day, Jesus intentionally brought Psalm 23 to life in illustrative form. He wanted those who were listening to him to know that he wanted to be their shepherd. He wanted to give them the free gift of salvation that's only through him. So he illustrated Psalm 23. He brought it to life. All four gospels record Jesus feeding the 5,000 plus their wives and children. And you know the story well. Jesus had just crossed the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. And even before they arrived at the shore, this huge crowd arrived Jesus began to teach them, and as the hour grew late, he took five loaves of unleavened bread, really just gigantic crackers, basically, and two fish, and he miraculously fed the tens of thousands who were there. But Jesus was doing way more than just feeding them food. He was demonstrating that he would be their savior and that he would shepherd them. Yahweh is my shepherd. Mark 6.34 he had compassion on them because they were sheep without what? A shepherd. I shall not want. John 6, 12 says that they ate their fill. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters or quiet waters. And next to the quiet lapping of the waters of the Sea of Galilee, Mark 6, 39 says he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Why is that detail there? Because Jesus is illustrating Psalm 23. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He made the offer in John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. I am the one that can restore your soul. I am the only way to righteousness. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
When he went to shore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them, literally pity in his gut. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Israel, occupied by Rome, ruled by Jewish leaders who were wicked to the core, crooked to the middle. Mark 6.41, in the middle of this, Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up to heaven, and said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. In Mark 6, 42 and 43, they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and the fish, an overflowing of leftovers. Surely goodness and loving kindness will pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. The very next day, Jesus told the same crowd, I am the bread of life. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You see, Jesus illustrated Psalm 23 with a real-life situation to cry out, I would be your shepherd, I would be your savior if you would only come. Jesus is the shepherd of Psalm 23, he would shepherd the lost to salvation, shepherd the saved to trust in him in the wilderness and in the valley and all the way to the house of Yahweh forever. So when you're walking and you stop and you realize I'm in the minefield, what do you do? You don't have to do anything except go to Psalm 23, take all the resources you have, dance your way out of that minefield. Either you'll step on one or you won't, and it won't matter. It won't matter. Another woman I had the privilege of ministering to a number of years ago was in the hospital. It's kind of a 50-50 chance whether she might recover from this cancer that was beginning to eat her body or not kind of right on the line, and I got there, and I, I told her I'd like to pray with her, and, and I said, I'd like to pray for the Lord to heal you, and, and she stopped me, and she's kind of weak, and she said, I, I don't really want you to do that, because he's going to heal me whether you pray for it or not, not no offense, Pastor, but um, I just want you to pray for me to do this well, and so that's what we prayed for. She did it well. She died in victory. She went to glory having won this final battle, and she was as peaceful and as restful as could be. That's what I want for you. That's what the Lord wants for you. A restful peace, an appointed path, and a future promise. It's all right there. It's all right there. Can I pray for you for just a moment? Our Father, the one thing that we all have in common is that that minefield of suffering, of pain, of tragedy, of those things that are so horrifying that they take our breath away, that we might even be tempted to, to cry out, that's, but that's not fair, it's too much, it's too big. That happens to other people, not to me. The one thing we have in common, all of us, Lord, is that we have been through that, we are going through that, or we shall go through it. So Lord, my prayer for this precious body of believers, this representative of the beautiful bride of Christ, is that each one here taking those resources from Psalm 23 would determine beforehand to walk faithfully with you, to not panic, to not be fearful, to not be afraid, but to walk through the valley of the shadow of death with the light of the world right beside them. Lord, how we suffer is the litmus test of our faith. And so I pray that we would be counted worthy to suffer for the name and that whatever suffering we endure, Lord, would be to the glory and honor and praise and fame of our God that we serve a God who literally can walk me through the valley of the shadow of death and bring me home. How glorious that is. Might you receive all the fame and glory from the suffering that you sovereignly bring into our lives so that the name of God would be lifted up and you may become higher and we may become less. Praise you and thank you in our shepherd's name. Amen.